You're watching Leafs Morning Take with host Nick Alberta and former NHLer Jay Rosehill. The show starts now. How about that? Shout out to my boy Isaiah Mustafa for the new intro here presented by Botano. It's time for the Tuesday edition of Leafs Morning Take. Nick Alberga and guest co-host Carter Hutton back in the mix once again following a Maple Leafs victory. How are we doing on this Tuesday, Huts? On the edge of my chair after last night, buddy. I'm here. This mustache is hot and let's roll. Dude, I hate roller coasters. Long story short. <laughs> I went to Darien Lake when I was 17. My buddies forced me, let's go, let's have a good time. We're 17, let's talk to some people, mix it up. And somehow, some way, they talked me into going on Superman, which at the time was like the fastest roller coaster in the world. And ever since, dude, I have not been able to go on a roller coaster. And I'm trying to translate that to the Maple Leafs. It, it feels the exact same way as I did on that roller coaster, scared for my life every time I watch Toronto Maple Leafs, sadly. It seems to be a habit right now, and uh, the last two against Tampa have been that way, that's for sure. But I, I feel like, again, it's like Groundhog Day, right? Like These are oh. things we've talked about so much. We've seen it so many times, and it's like infuriating to the sense of like just having a complete game. It's always this roller coaster. They get behind, and they come back, and just relying on the stars again, as always, right? Yeah, pretty much the same story. We're going to go over that. we got Frank Saravalli coming up in about 20 minutes from now. Yes, we're going to get to Sheldon Keefe. We're going to get to some trade activity. So Frank's coming up in about 15 or so. I want to get to a question from Danny Alexander off the bat right here and repre- uh, appreciate, excuse me, I should say, your support throughout the seasons here of Least Morning Take Now, season number two. How, when, why did you develop such a passion for hockey? I get this question a lot. Uh, it actually started at a young age. My grandfather used to bring me to the Martin Brodeur Arena in Montreal. As you know, I was born in Montreal, moved to Toronto, the, the GTA, when I was five years old. And I developed a passion for hockey. But weirdly enough, people don't know this about me. Baseball is my, my, my number one sport. I excelled in baseball, played really good baseball growing up. But for some reason, my brother played hockey. A lot of my friends played hockey. I started playing hockey. I developed that passion. And I I was just like a stat stuffer too. Like I I just watched and watched and watched. And I was that kid who sat in front of the screen playing video games and like calling the action like I was Bob Cole. And then next thing you know, uh, what, 23, 24 years later, I'm uh, I'm a hockey broadcaster. It's crazy. Yeah, I can see how you go into it. Obviously, I played a lot of ball here too. But for me, hockey was... It was a sport, right? I grew up in Thunder Bay, Ontario. That was pretty much all you did, right? It was, uh, you know, we get a lot of winter, a lot of cold. So I like lived at the outdoor rinks and played. And and even now, like being retired, I still play a lot. But I remember for me, my turning point was uh, I was 13 years old. I remember I loved hockey. I was, you know, decent at it, not that great. And then I went to the World Juniors in 99 um, when Luongo was on the team, Roberto Luongo. And they ended up losing to Russia in overtime. And that was kind of like a TSN turning point for me. I just loved it. I was hooked. And that's when I really started to grow and get better and from there it was just you know i just love the game it was never even when i was playing in the nhl and stuff it was never work to me right like i just didn't love the grind and it, it was awesome so i think from that it's where the passion came from here's a question when did you get that feel that you might actually make the nhl like did you have that moment where you're like you had to pinch yourself and we're like man I, i'm gonna probably make the nhl uh i i think when i was like when i first was kind of in the american league a little bit I almost was, I kind of had like this imposter syndrome, right? Like even when I got to college, I got the NCAA and I was like never touted as being good. And yeah. And then all of a sudden you started to have success and I would see like comparables. Um, You know, you'd play against a guy that you could see you were just as good as, and then he would move on and play in the NHL or wherever. And you were like, man, like I have this. And then all of a sudden it was like one summer. I remember just being like way stronger. And it was almost like all that work kind of started to pay off like day-to-day foundational stuff. And, and the next thing you know, you're just like, you find ways to be more confident, right? I think that was for me. I I definitely wasn't like a phenom by any means. So I think that slow grind over time really uh, built up to it. Hey, it's great to hear, man. You had a really, really good career. Now you're flourishing and broadcasting. I see you everywhere. So great to have you on Leafs Morning Take at the Leafs Nation 401, where you could subscribe on YouTube at the Leafs Nation 401. Again, where you could subscribe, search Leafs Morning Take. Wherever you get your podcast, there's so much to cover. So we're going to dive right into it again. Frank Saravalli is coming up in about 15 from now. Uh, Brought to you by DoorDash, it's time for the appetizer. For a limited time, our listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees for on their first order, excuse me, of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter code NATION25. That's 25% off, up to $10 in value and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter code NATION25. Don't forget, that's code NATION25 
for 25% off your first order with DoorDash. Again, it's a capitalized nation 25 offer valid in Canada. Subject to change, terms apply. So a six five, just dude, insane. It reminded me a lot of the first meeting, October 21st. Where do you want to start? So the Leafs send a, a four game skid, but where do you want to start in this conversation? Oh, I guess the start, like just the first period, like it's just tough coming out of the gate at home, especially after the last game. You'd think they're going to come out flying and, and it's just, it's hard to watch. It's hard to get into the game, right? You know, you obviously Matthew scores, he's trying to get the crowd going, but it's like you lose your fan base right away. Obviously, when are they going to come out with that, like kick in the ass, like, like have a fire lit under them right out of the gate. It's, it's tough to watch. I was going to ask you, so you're the former goalie. Uh, how, how much of the blame? I know the blame game is tough, especially for a goalie, but how much of the blame on that start should be on Ilya Samsonov? So, like, they're giving up a lot as well, right? We know that yeah. they give up a lot, but he is very sloppy right now. When I'm talking about technical, like, even you watch the goal where it, uh, it goes back and forth, they're seeming on the power play. He's, like, two feet outside his post on every play. He's not – the puck goes back door and Kucherov fires it in, but – He's coming across so flat, like he's given up angle where you'd watch in the, in the later game or even, even the way Johansson plays, like granted, he's not as good, but he's deeper. He manages his crease better. The puck travels so fast East West nowadays. And it's not just Tampa Bay. It's every team. Every team is zipping that puck around the zone. He's gaining so much depth and his feet are so wide that his first movement is to like recollect his feet and try to get to the next spot. You can't do that. Your feet have to be underneath. You You have to do, be efficient. And right now, Sammy looks like he's just struggling. He looks like Bambi on the ice and he's missing this play. Then it's a scramble to get back to the next one. And it's ugly to watch. Is it at a point where Tampa is just in his head? Like I'm sure you had players or teams that you played against in your career where you're like, man, I just, I have a weird, weird, funky feeling. Like I got it in baseball all the time. I get it in hockey where you play a team and it just, every, your, your mojo is just a bit off. Like I, I know for the most part, Samsonov's had his struggles, but like he's had his moments where he's made a couple saves against Tampa. That's now twice this season. Uh, where he's just been lit up, didn't even make it to the first intermission. Like he's wearing the ball cap 15 minutes into the first period here. It's tough too. And and you see the fourth one go in and he's looking at the bench, right? Like that's an yeah. instant doubt in my mind. That is not a confident guy. You can see under his mask, he's staring at the bench. He knows his night's done. He knows he's playing like shit. But also last year, he played well against Tampa in the playoffs, right? So you I think know. there's that mojo. It's just the confidence isn't there. And it's a tough game to play when you're trying to do too much. His comparable would be like, as I got into my Buffalo days where we would give up so much, I almost started to think I needed to do more. So I would like be more aggressive and move more. And, and it's, it's it has the opposite effect on your game when you're compact and simple and let the game come to you. It's way more efficient. And I always talk about that, like efficiency, because over time, like majority of the game, you're moving without getting shots, right? You're just trying to set yourself up for the best success when that shot comes. But if you're sloppy out of the gate and you start falling behind plays, that's when it snowballs on you. And then it becomes desperation. And and even if you're making saves, shit, shit ends up all over the place. Oh, yeah. And look, I'm not trying to defend Ilya Samsonov, but the way they started last night uh, in, in the first period, especially the big boys at Tampa were just snapping it around. Mm -hmm. You can't give anybody in this league, even San Jose, time and space. They'll burn you. And it was so easy for Hedman, Kucherov, Stamkos, Point. Like, they were snapping around like it's the, the pregame, the, the morning skate, man. Like, and that's the embarrassing part for me. It almost angers me more when the Leafs start flexing their muscles. They start snapping around themselves. They look like an all-star team. It's like, where is this? They're, they're so inconsistent. It's so wild. It's outrageous. Yeah, and I, it's got to start in your own end, right? Like, you know, yeah. we know we're going to score. Get your power plays, win games. Like, that's the way the game should be played. Let's defend, stay tight, give up. We're going to have to give up chances, right? Chances are going to come, but they have to be more predictable, right? They're giving up really good looks. And granted, I think it gets overexposed when your goalie isn't playing as well, when he's struggling. Mm -hmm. But it, how is he going to find his game when you're giving up those kind of chances? I think it goes hand in hand, right? Where if you can find a way to let him find his game, structure a little more predictableness, and maybe we lack a little bit of offense, but now you start winning these, let's win the special team games. You know you're going to get your looks on the power play, defend hard, win those 2-1 games, because that's what it's going to take to win when it matters. For the record, I don't think they're out of the woods at all. Like, I know they come out, they come from behind, they beat Tampa. But just put it this way. Like, they lose that game. The sky's falling. Everything's burning to the ground. And Sheldon Keefe's job's on the line. Like, I, I still think this is right up here in terms of, like, a level where it's like you're in trouble. Like, you have Ottawa coming in. Desperate team on Wednesday. Very interesting matchup as well, which we'll get to tomorrow in the preview. But, like, the fact that Ottawa's fighting for their lives right now, their head coach, like, 
I don't think the Leafs proved anything or rid themselves of anything with that victory. I don't know if you feel the same way. No, I think it just puts more doubt into the, yeah. you know, and you're in your, and look who you're playing against. Like no offense to JJ. Like I love the kid. He's a good goalie, but like, he's not Vasilevsky. They yeah, don't even lucky. have their guy. If, if it's a four, one lead, you think they blow that oh, lead with Vasilevsky in that? Like no, no chance. No, like that's the other thing you got to look at, like not to be devil's advocate here, but yeah. that's not the Tampa Bay team you're going to see when it comes to the playoffs. No, I agree. And I, I really, again, that they were fortunate once again, like they were the first time out. I know, I know, um, Johansson made like 51 saves the first time out. I thought he was decent last night, but they were very, very fortunate. Vasilevsky still three weeks away from returning around American Thanksgiving, but Hey, Big time positive, Matthew Nyes. Uh, we all know Jay Rosehill has a man crush on this guy, and understandably so. What he does so early on in his career is so impressive, and he seems to ignite the big boys. And again, they had the chem last year. We know he skates with Matthews in the offseason. That line combining for 10 points last night, they were outstanding, man. Yeah, I thought Marner was the best player on the ice. Like, I think that might be the best game I've seen from Mitch Marner. He was just everywhere and doing everything. And I think the three dynamics sets up well, right? You, you have Marner, who's your Swiss. He does everything, right? He's one of the best players. And then Matthews, he's a pure goal scorer, playmaker. He can do it all as well. But then Matthew Nyes is just energy. Like, he is just going in. He's doing everything. And on top of that, the kid can play. Like, that was a hell of a goal, he said, knocking that puck down and making that play. Oh. And then the feed to Matthews. Like, what a play. The vision the confidence to make that play. And, you know, obviously Matthews has the patience there to just slide that under the five hole. Most guys just bang that right off the goalie's pad, but the poise to put it back underneath him is world-class. And, and he's, it's actually absurd to think what he's putting up right now, more points. He's got more goals than a whole team in the NHL, which is it, it, it really, again, just try to contextualize that Austin Matthews, like what 12 games in or whatever it is, has more goals than the San Jose sharks as we have this call. Like it, it's, it's crazy, but it just shows you. And again, I won't say like Leafs Nation, we know how good this guy is, but a lot of people wondering where Austin Matthews was last year in terms of production. Off year, still at 40 tucks. This guy's so back, man. He, he He's running this league, and there's not one goaltender on the planet who has his number. He just dominates what he wants to. No, it's crazy, especially with his speed and skill, right? A lot of guys are more like stationary. Um, you think of Ovi just shooting it, shooting it. Sam Coase is shooting it. With Matthew's speed and skill and the way he like changes the angle with his puck. I remember playing them all the time when they play that umbrella power play and they'd have like yeah. Tavares as the bumper dropping off. When he gets that puck and starts coming downhill on you, you're literally like, you feel like victimized. And then he'd go, he'll go five hole on you, right? And then you're trying to be patient because you don't want to go down. Then he puts it under the bar. It's like, and the shot is so, you can't read it. Like the whip of his stick and the strength that he has, it's coming off hundred miles an hour and it's slinging somewhere. You can't read it. It's, it's, it's amazing what he can do at that speed is the, the impressive thing to me is, and he does it all the time. He keeps the goalie honest, right? Like that's the best way I would describe it. It's like, you can't cheat to any direction because he can beat you so many different ways. Right? Yeah. He even had that look last night where Marner makes a nice pass over to him and he comes down, he takes a slap shot. Right. Mm -hmm. But Johansson ends up like six feet out of the crease and he may, it just hits him. He makes the save and Marner almost gets the rebound and puts it in. And that's where it comes to as a goalie. It's like, I have to sell the farm to this guy and he's nifty enough to make the extra play too, which is, it's a crazy dynamic what he has and what he can do, especially at his size too. Right. You don't really see a lot of big men like that doing it. Hutz, uh, I don't know what the formula is of this team is right now. Well, I know what it is. It's like get a hatcher from Austin Matthews, maybe win the game. I, I just don't know if that's going to be conducive to success for the entire season. Like they they have to find a way to rein things in defensively. Like it's it's absurd the numbers this guy's putting up. Imagine if Matthews wasn't scoring at this clip where this team would be right now. No, I don't. I, it'd be a scary. Lot. It'd be a fire sale. There'd be a jersey sale every night on the rink. But yeah, it's it's tough, right? I, and you know, defense wins championships, right? We've heard that since we were kids, right? It's it's something that, but you have to build toward it, right? Like build towards something, right? I I, I get it's a slow growth and you have some new guys in place, but at this point in the season, like there's got to be something like, where's that game that's going to give you that feel? Like it's it's moving forward. Like I just don't game. think yeah. there hasn't been a complete game yet, right? It's just been yeah. frustrating. If it's not like the goalie stealing one, like when Wall, when Washington played really well, or like coming off the bench, it's always like catch up or get ahead, blow a lead. It's just like, it's exciting from a fan standpoint, but not from like what we want to see moving forward. I love the ISO shots of Sheldon Keefe on the bench, man. Like the <laughs> guy, you can tell he just wants to go over and like Goldberg spear Ilya Samsonov. Like he can't even look in the guy's direct. Like it's, I in my wildest dreams could not have predicted that Ilya Samsonov could not even make a save considering his rise to 
prominence last year with this team, starting game one of the Stanley Cup playoffs. He is just so fragile right now, and that must be the smallest feeling in the world for a coach, knowing you have one guy who's got like 15 games of NHL experience, and then you have a guy who is just fighting it beyond belief right now. But I want to get more back into the crease conversation a bit later on after we have Frank Saravalli in about five from now. But I thought the third line was much more noticeable last night. So Nick Robertson makes his season debut, picks up an apple. Max stole me up the middle. What'd you make of that? I liked it. I thought it was a lot more energy. I thought they played well. Robertson brings a good dynamic to it, right? We talked about that a yeah. bit yesterday. He is relentless on the puck. He plays well. And obviously that line getting a huge goal, right? I we, I talked about Yarn Kroc. Uh, Yarny, he's a heck of a player, but he's very Big smart, ball. skilled, picks his moments. And you think Domi don't, don't makes a nice play on the wall. And Robertson finds that soft area, which is important, right? He can do all the things. He can be your bull, but he's also a goal scorer at heart, right? So he knows that. And this is what's going to keep him in the league is doing those little things. And then he's going to get a chance to play and score and do that as he develops his game on the other side of the puck. And he gets that shot through. Even on that play, Sorelli's coming up to force him and he gets it through his legs and he gets it on that. Most of those most guys just pound that into the D-man or, or the forward coming out on, to block. He gets it through and Yarncroft's in good position to make a good save. And I love JJ, but he's a human rebound machine. So it's it's one of those ones. Just get the puck. He wears two blockers some nights, it seems like. Ben. He, uh, and Yardy's right there, Johnny on the spot. I love the uh, goalie fraternity turning on each other right now, but I mean, that's an accurate, <laughs> accurate assessment. I, I still think you look at the job John Cooper has done in Tampa five, three and four. I think it is now with Vasilevsky for them to even stay afloat for them to be in the conversation for a playoff spot is downright amazing. And, and I have to give Johansson credit. Like he's been better than expected, but Tampa looks ordinary, man. Like the Leafs have their number. I couldn't believe that stat. Tampa's lost 11 consecutive um, OT games. That's regular season and playoffs. It's very unlike that team. I know that. I did not know that. I heard that stat last yeah. night and I was like, wow, that is a lot. I never, it really caught me off guard, especially with the talent they have, right? You think yeah. like putting Hedman, I remember losing that. I lost in overtime to him. So um, I guess I was the last one maybe, but uh, they, be. with those guys, like with, especially with Hedman on the point and, and Sergachev, these guys that can move and fill space and make plays. And then obviously their forward dynamic and Vasilevsky, I think that's kind of a crazy stat, but I did love the ISO cam last night of John Cooper on the bench. Um, just like pouting, upset. Uh, I was like, this game has got so many storylines to it, and it was entertaining, that's for sure. Man, it, it's a different feel. I don't care what these guys on Tampa say. Anytime they come in against Toronto, anytime they play the Leafs in general, it's a different feel. I don't know if you caught the comments before the game. Obviously, the media, Toronto media, we do what we do best, and that's like sort of, you know, ignite the fire. And they they asked Stamkos, they asked Cooper about like Toronto not jumping in. Like they, they worded it a specific way, but Tampa like indirectly said, yeah, like, it's common sense. You jump in for your teammate. They know exactly what they're doing. John Cooper's a, a veteran. Stamkos is a veteran. And Tampa, like, you know, plays to that music. You know what I mean? And and for the Leafs to step up the way they did, I think it was great. But it also was infuriating. I won't lie. I watched that game and I'm like, where is the consistency where you show up in the first period? Mind you, again, goaltending was dreadful. You, you need to stop sometimes. But just so lack of days ago, lack of urgency, lack of desperation, like the whole drill, we know it by now. And that's what I think drives people wild, including the coaching staff, the management, where you see sometimes stretches from this team. And it's like they're the Globetrotters and sometimes they're the Washington Generals. Yeah, I agree. It is wild. And I just think over time that game gets old, right? I I, mm -hmm. I, I keep circling back to it all. The, 100%, right? It's like so predictable. And I can see why they get crucified in the media and the fan base struggles with it because it's like – we get promised all these things. We have our core four. We're going back to it. We're going to run it back, right? And then again, you start seeing the same pattern over and over again. And it's almost like, when is this going to change, right? I feel like I'm going to get my heart broken again, right? It's just, yeah, it's tough to watch. And and then there's always the struggles inside it, right? When you don't have the goaltending, that's really hurting. It is. Uh, I want to give a shout out first and foremost to one of our new sponsors here on the show, Sober Carpenter. Hook the kid up big time. So thank you very much. Hold the alcohol. Keep the flavor. Enjoy a range of non-alcoholic beers so good that you'll think it's the real thing. Uh, look uh, look up Sober Carpenter, excuse me, at Sobeys, Loblaws, Whole Foods, Metro, Farm Boy, other retailers today as we bring in today's guest, the one and only Frank Saravalli. Frank, uh, thank you so much for doing this. Really, really appreciate it. How you doing? And uh, your thoughts on the Maple Leaf start to the season here, bud? Uh, I think it's been fair. I think that's maybe the best way to explain it. Definitely some highs and some lows and a lot in between for a team that's just kind of, you know, I was thinking about this the other day because I was asked about it. 
you know, people in Toronto were saying, why can't this Leaf team have a regular season like the Bruins or like the Golden Knights or pick a really good team? And I think my answer is they're just, they're not on the same level. And part of it is a mental thing because I heard you guys talking about it on the way in, an instinctual thing. But I also think part of it is a roster construction thing. Um, if you want to take a 30,000 foot view, I think they've got a defense core that needs help. I think so, Frank. So for me, like from the perspective of the back end, that's like where I want to start. For me, that was always, I think, in good teams that I played on, it started there and it goes there. And I think it starts with the D-man. I know Sammy struggling a bit. I kind of watched a similar Stuart Skinner out in Edmonton kind of with the same struggle. He's sloppy. It's He's not composed. It's not that. But where do you build this back end when there's no support for a struggling goalie? That's the hard part because it becomes a chicken and the egg thing, right? Carter, everyone's complaining, saying, well, why can't the Oilers get a stop? And then the next thing is, well, why is their defensive zone play so soft coming off the rush when Pew Suter can just walk down Main Street and shoot? Those things all go hand in hand. And I think when you look at the Leafs and, well, first off, they're obviously dealing with some injuries right now. But the other part too is like, I think to me, the John Klingberg addition to this team this year really spoke to, I think, some of the holes that this group has. I mean, think about the role that he's come in and asked to take. It's essentially to spell Morgan Riley on PP1 and come in there and, and do a better job because there was an opening to do so. But at the same time, then you need, you're asking a lot of John Klingberg on the back end and your own end where he's really struggled. I think confidence has been a huge issue for him. And it's not like he's taking nothing of your salary cap. It's still a decent enough salary chunk that, you know, you wonder if they could have perhaps filled that position instead of with someone that can help you on the power play where you've got your offensive guys that should kind of take control there. If they could have used maybe some more help to play better in their own end, more stout defensively. I don't know exactly off the top of my head who that person might be, but that's sort of, if you're thinking archetype, adding a power play quarterback for me wasn't really like the big need for this team. Yeah, I think the thinking was to, to lend some support, as you mentioned, to like a Morgan Rally in terms of a puck mover, but like the guy can't play defense. And I think it's becoming crystal clear that they have it a big should have been puck. crystal clear if they watched him in mini. You're right. You're right. No, and, and and that's the thing that baffled me, Frank, was more so like the amount of money they gave him knowing, you know, what they were getting. They had to know what they were getting, no? And that's the thing. You see John Klingberg in mini last year after the trade deadline, in Anaheim before that, and then, you know, you could kind of like pinpoint on a map where his game started to fall apart. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's physically or mentally or what, after the contract situation didn't work itself out in Dallas. And he apparently left like 50 million bucks on the table. I know I'd be sick to my stomach if I did that, <laughs> but I can't imagine what it's like to try and feel like you need to go out every night and try and earn that back at a time when, you know, your confidence isn't there, your game's not there. And then physically you're getting older as well. He's being exposed left and right. There's no doubt about that. Um, so what, what's your sense uh, on the trade market? Like, is it too early realistically for teams who think they're contenders to go out there and grab a guy? Like, all, you know, people want to point fingers to the Calgary Flames. Yeah, they make a lot of sense. But is it way too early to make a deal, you think? I don't think it's too early. I think there's a select few teams that are sort of in the mood to mix things up. I Obviously, the Calgary Flames and their defense core with the pending UFAs that they have, they're in a spot where they're beginning to look around on the market and check in what the value of some of their guys might be. Tanev, Zadarov, in addition to the obvious one in, in Hannafin. Um, I think you've got uh, some other teams that are reaching some desperation status, but I'm not entirely sold that the Leafs are there quite yet in terms of getting to the point that they want to mix things up. I also feel like watching this team these results that we've seen to this point are probably about as middling as they could be. Um, I, I'd imagine at some point your forward group is going to click better than it has. You're going to get more consistency out of Marner and Matthews. You're going to see more from Bertuzzi at some point. How many stretches like this of 10 games in his career has he, has the production been where it's been? Probably not many. Um, I'd expect to see more like the, aren't these pieces just going to fall into place? So 
I, I'd imagine there's probably a bit of a patient approach in that you also don't want to try and wedge a square peg into a round hole. No, I agree. I think that's, I think it will come right. That depth. I, the fourth line worries me, Ryan Reeves with the speed of the game now. Um, but I'm going to go back to the net here. It's my thing. And I think a good example will be last year with the Oilers, right? Again, I want to circle back to that because they overuse Skinner and they get to the playoffs and Jack Campbell was a liability. And right now to me, Samsonov is just struggling, but, but to what extent do we overextend wall? Like he's still a young kid. Like, is he ready to run with this? And like, where do we get to get him ready to be, you know, you need a one, a one B you need to push, right? There's not many guys in this league that can carry 60 games and still be productive when it comes to the playoffs. So this goalie management right now for me is going to be really important. I think as we go here. So Carter, I'm going to push back against that. I'm going to say, is Joe wall really that young? And the answer experience wise is yes. In terms of NHL experience, but he's actually only one year younger than Samsonov. And he's 25, and we've seen lots of goalies come into this league at a younger age and take the ball and run with it. I agree with your assessment in that if he's on a 60-game pace, it's way too much. But for the time being, while he's carrying the ball, let him run with it for a bit. And then when he begins to cool off, then you go back to Samsonov and see if you can you know, allow him to find his confidence again. I think that's the answer for right now. But I think... He, you know, Joe Wall has been building for three years to this moment. Last year, you know, has a new contract. They designed it purposely for this second year of the deal for him to be in the NHL. And now he's there. He needs to just play. Cuts, you got a retort to that, bud? No, I like it. I like the plan. I, I think it's good. I just think it's. For me, my concern is the overusage, right? Like if we're going to burn him out, like managing him, I think Samsonov will find his game. But at this point, it's got to be, we have to like play the guy that's playing. Because watching last night was just, it's tough to watch. He's all I, I would just right now. Yeah, I would just add too that I think there's a silver lining in all this. And I believe the Leafs have like five games in the next 17 days because of the global series. So that, that Frank, that gives Curtis Sanford some time here. Like I, I'm under the belief that at some point, Elias Samsonov has to find his game. Like you just don't go from last year to this where you can't stop a beach ball. I don't think you can. I think at some point, if he does do that, or if you think he's already there, yeah. You've got to go the Jack Campbell route of last year, which is I'm not even entirely certain there was an injury. You got to just sit out for a couple of weeks and find yourself again. And, mm -hmm. and in the same breath in Edmonton right now, what I'd be advocating for today is bringing up Cal Pickard and seeing if you can get two, three, four wins out of him. I don't think he's a long-term answer. I don't think you just walk in and sprinkle some pixie dust, but in Bakersfield, he's got a 940 save percentage this season in four games. Even if you got to 905 in the NHL, it's an enormous step forward from what the Oilers have been getting to this point. That's what I'd say for right now. And is there someone in the meantime that you can bring up from the Marlies to just give Samsonov some time to find himself? Would, would, would Martin Jones be an option? I know people are bringing his name up. Why not? I yeah. mean, he played 48 games for the Kraken last year. Yeah. I mean, why, like, why wouldn't he be able to spell this team for a two, three, four week stretch? Because that's the thing, right? So you call him up. He's got to go back on waivers. Is that right? Nope. Uh, there no. are no more re-entry waivers. Okay. You would only need waivers after he's on the roster for 10 or more games or 30 okay. or more days. So they'd mm -hmm. have some time to bring him up for six, seven games and send him back. It's all about cap space. Yeah, exactly. Because that's what I'm thinking. Like, I I think to a degree, Frank, it makes sense. It's just more so like, can can you stomach rostering three goalies, right? I mean, Montreal's doing it. The Flyers were doing it for a while. I think there's three or four other teams that have been carrying three goalies. Not entirely ideal, but mm -hmm. I mean, for the time being, why not? Yeah, the way Samson is playing, it's, uh, it's problematic right now, I would say, for this team. Uh, I want a temperature check from you. Is Sheldon Keefe on the hot seat, in your opinion, everything you've gathered? I don't think so. I mean, look, we were talking about a team that, um, you know, at certain stretches this year has underachieved. I think we are all in agreement that we'd like to see more fire. Um, I think the killer instinct has been a problem for this team for, I think, longer than Sheldon Keefe's been here. And when you hear Brendan Shanahan talk about it two or three summers ago, and the key to that phrase killer instinct is not the killer part. It's that it is instinctual. And I don't know that 
the coach or any coach is going to bring that out. You either have it or you don't. And I think maybe part of what's disappointing is at least in telling them or listening to them retell the story would be that it took, you know, not in the moment for people to realize that it took until seeing it and, and looking at the video and how bad it looked for everyone to really connect the dots on that. That's something that should be noted in real time. And I, I just, I think everyone would like to see a little more because, you know, you can make the argument about, um, you know, can teams that don't have that style or instinct or toughness win? Um, maybe, but I think when push comes to shove in big moments, when this team has wilted the most, that's what kind of stands out to me is who's going to step up and get that goal. Who's going to be in the fight at the exact moment in time that it matters. You know, you can't win a Stanley cup in November, but you know, when you continually act the same way and do the same thing over and over again, that's the part that people start to lose faith and hope on. So for me, it's for me, it starts, obviously we talk about Keith and culture and, just creating that mentality, but we circle back to it like this core four. Like, again, you're seeing the same things over and over and over again. I know Tavares is a great leader on the ice, but is he? A, he's a quiet guy. Is he vocal in the room? Is there – I know Ryan Reeves is a character, but, like, he's not going out there every shift and actually making a dramatic impact on a game. So Playing eight minutes a night. Right? Like, he's not Barely. changing a game, right? So, with that core four, like, at some point, where does one move or what? what's the first to drop here? Because we can't go into this season again doing the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah, but I think part of the problem is that the the organization as a philo philosophy, if I could get that out, there they is. have a, developed this approach that, well, you know, bringing the same players back time after time in this core four may seem like lunacy, but are we actually hurting ourselves? If Are we making our team worse if we were to move one of these players? So that's the sort of pickle and conundrum that they found themselves in. I personally tend to think that when you do the same thing over and over again and don't expect different results. So if you're going to do it and you're going to convince yourself that you need the warm, snuggly blanket of, uh, oh my God, what are we going to do if we don't have this guy anymore? Instead of looking at the positive and the upside of, well, what happens if we were to take that nine, 10, whatever million dollars it is and sprinkle it on four players or vastly improve our back end or whatever it might be to go in a slightly different direction. Um, that to me is the welcomed approach. And maybe we're just meeting that naturally um, this upcoming summer with Nylander's deal coming up uh, and eventually then Marner. But I personally would have liked to have seen change come already, but they seem to twist themselves into a pretzel saying, oh my God, what are we going to do if we don't have these guys? Yeah, it's pretty much it. And I, I've been saying for a couple of weeks, like the proof is going to be put in the pudding, excuse me, come the springtime. We'll see if this team can finally get over that hump in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Last one, uh, Ryan Reeves. We just talked about it. Uh, I mean, we all know what this guy can bring in the room, but it's quite clear. He, I mean, he can't play. I don't know how to put it, but like he, he is, he is really, really fighting it. He's struggling. The team is struggling when he's on the ice. Uh, is there a scenario where the Leafs just like, you know, admit their mistake and, and try to do something here? I mean, there might be at some point, but I don't think not even a quarter of the way into the season is going to be the answer. Yeah. Um, I think the easy answer is that so much of his cap hit, like 90% of it can be buried in the minors that um, there is a, a viable alternative, but for a three-year deal to go this poorly this quickly, I think has certainly... Um, been an eye opener for a bunch of people. I just, I don't expect them to admit defeat on that just yet. And also if there really is an opportunity for him to instill some change and maybe add a bit of fire to this team. And probably, as you mentioned, not necessarily from an on ice perspective, it's going to take a little bit of time for that to seep in that. I think they'd want to keep him there to see what that's like. Yeah, to me, it's just a bit of a different story because, like, at this point, you know what Ryan Reeves is. It's not like we're going to magically wake up tomorrow. He's going to be a different player, whereas, like, I know Domi and Bertuzzi, those guys are getting a lot of heat in this market, but uh, you would have to think their better games are in front of them this season. So a lot cooking, uh, as per usual, in this market. Frank, appreciate your time today. I can't believe 
that crown royal bottle behind you there, there's less in that one than there is in mine that's surprising to me yeah but. there's a, i think there's a hole in it, it just, <laughs> keeps, just keeps evaporating hey before i go i wanted to ask yeah. uh carter because I, I we've never actually had a chance to talk about this you won't find it on your hockey reference page or hockey db or even cap friendly but mm -hmm. i covered the flyers that year when you were did you come straight out of lowell i came straight out of, i played four games in the american league and then i played a game the fourth game was in Manchester. They called me up the night, the next night. I jumped on a plane in the morning, came in uh, Flyers versus Devils, Marty Brodeur versus Brian Boucher. And it was actually wow. uh shirt off your back night, fan appreciation night. So I remember standing on the goal line with like Pronger, Gagne, Richards, Car, all these like phenoms. And then some poor sucker won my jersey. So I was, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty funny memory for me. And I think we were all sitting there like, who the hell is this guy? Where did he come from? The Flyers, I think, used like seven goalies that year. If I'm not mistaken, they signed someone out of Switzerland uh, like for the last two or three games of the year to sit on the bench because they just couldn't keep anyone healthy. Yeah, I was. Uh, it was emergency backup basis, right? I didn't have a contract, so I was up. I was on a Sunday. It was a matinee game. I remember I got to go out partying with all the guys after, Sick. and then Monday I was back on a flight back at Lowell in class. People were like, "What's going on?" I was like, "I'm not too sure what just happened." But it was. A Did you get cool what'd trip. you get? Like 500 bucks for that? Yeah, I was 500 or 600 bucks, and then actually the guy that won my jersey. It was a great story. He went back, found it was my first game, um, and called the a team and and donated the jersey back, and they shipped That's it to nice. me. So I. So I ended up never told anyone. I actually framed it for my parents and they still have it hanging in their basement because it was my first ever NHL game. So, But there's never any record of you having played because you no, didn't I know. get in the game, but that's, that's the life of a goalie. No, so you got to see my rookie card. It's it's Lowell gear, Flyers jersey, San Jose logo. So I always <laughs> get people to sign it. It's like this kid looks real confused. I remember we came down to interview Carter. I, I guess it was like before the game. And like, honestly, everyone was like, what are we even at? Like, Where'd this guy come from? <laughs> Unreal. <laughs> Unreal stuff. And uh, great to have Huts on the team here at Daily Faceoff yep. and the Leafs Nation and the Nation Network. Uh, Frank, thanks so much for this, bud. Thanks, Frank. See you guys. Take care. The one and only Frank Saravalli uh, with a bit of a temperature check early on in the season. It's always important to touch in with Frank to see what's going on behind the scenes with this team. And it, it's pretty crazy. I, I won't lie for like, what, 11, 12 games in, just how many different fires there seems to be with this team. But your pathway is crazy, man. Like that's I, I I forgot that even happened. Where that I remember that year vividly, where the Flyers had like seven or eight goalies, but you're one of them. That's sick. Yeah, it was crazy. It was a yeah. whirlwind experience. I remember sitting in like pregame. I always had a funny story. We're like warming up for the game, right? So I have no clue where to go, what to do. I'm just kind of lost, and I, and I go in. So I'm like going to tape my stick after the meeting, and I walk in, and it's Riley Cote, Aaron Asham, and Daniel Carcillo. And they're, they have their sticks and they're playing air guitar to Metallica in the dressing room. And I'm like this green college kid. So I come around the corner with my stick and I'm like, what the f is going on? Yeah. I just quickly turn around and run away because I was so scared. So it was uh, it was obviously a cool experience. And getting to see Marty Broder, I remember the trainers give me a hard time in warm-ups. Like, hey, kid, like quit staring. He's on the other team. Jesus. Yeah, I know. Because that's that would be the thing for me is like if I, if I ever made the show like or had a buddy made the show like how do you not get caught like staring let's say you're a kid now and you show up and you're wheeling around at Scotiabank Arena in the pregame your buckets off and then you see the best goal scorer on the planet on the other side Austin Matthews is his mustache it's Movember like how do you not just stare at the guy and be like, holy fuck I wish I was that guy yeah, there's a lot of moments like that, right? Yeah. I feel like he's, especially when you first start, right? I remember same thing that game sitting on the bench. It was four nothing. Boucher was playing really well. Boucher was actually great to me my whole career after yeah. that. Like, awesome. Always spoke, spoke really well about me. Um, and then they got one on him. There was like eight minutes left in the game or something. He comes to the bench on the TV timeout. He's like, hey, Hutz, you're going in now. Like, I think broke my show. You can get it. And I remember being like a deer in the headlights. Like, I'm not, he's like, no, no, I'm just fucking with you. <laughs> I was like, so scared. I was like, the last thing I wanted to do was have to be any part of this game other than sitting on the bench. Man, I was thinking about that last night. Like, like it, it sucks to be a goalie. I'm not even a goalie. And I, like, Joe Wall probably, like, again, wheeling in on a Monday, probably had a nice weekend, feeling good about his game. Sammy's starting against Tampa. That's in the back of your mind. You're like, oh, shit. Like, this guy got lit up two weeks ago. There, there's a chance. Because, like, I don't know about you. If you know you got nothing going on, like, you, you, you rip it back a bit. You peel it back a bit more. And you, you know that you have the green light special. But then Joe Wall has to come in again. Like, that has to be the worst feeling for a goalie. When you think you have the night off, you're just going to challenge some popcorn. And the next thing you know, you're in the game. It's tough, though. But, you know, you can do it every day, right? I remember those days 
you were so checked out, right? So like modest. You're, you're I love still, it. So modest. <laughs> you're still at the rank, right? You're you're at the rank, right? But you're like on the bench, and you're like the last thing I want to do is be in this game right now. But you know, yeah. like you can feel, you see your partner, you're around the game enough. Like I think I watched more than I ever played, right? Like I probably yeah. watched five, six hundred of them. But you get a feel for the game. But there's nights where it's like you are so checked out because you don't want to be the guy. And I always thought it was tough for positional players having to play every night, but. But you know how to fire it up, right? It's something you do every day. You can get into it. And sometimes that's like the best. There's no warning. You just get in the crease and it's just like go time. The adrenaline gets going and you can be dialed in. And sometimes coming off the bench is the best I've played. But it is yeah, it is it is taxing though, like that mental standpoint. And, and I can't imagine how Sammy feels right now. You're wearing these games on your sleeve too. Like he's going home like, I don't care what he says to the media or how he acts. He cares. He wants to do well. He wants the big contract. He wants everything. But it's hard, man. It's taxing, especially in this media. You know. I don't mean this as a joke. Like he, he's he's having a nervous breakdown. <laughs> like I don't know how to put it. I did you see him yesterday when he came off? He was like took his helmet off. He chucked it. Like man, it's again, and, and that's why Carey Price is a legend. That's why the demeanor of like Joseph Wall granted very early on. You're gonna have your moments, and guys handle stress a different way, and. And I get that, but like to not lose your gasket over that happening again, when you can't make a save, like has to be the worst, smallest feeling in the world. It's very similar, like playing baseball when you're just not seeing the ball and, and you, you have no read on the spin or anything. It's the worst feeling in the world. And I think right now, like he, he's so fragile, but like, man, he, he, he's having a nervous breakdown and everybody's seeing it. Yeah. I think right now, like Frankie talked about a little bit of space, a little bit of time yeah. to just protect him and let him find it. Right. I always go back to like, what is he doing off the ice? Hard work, you know, his attitude. Can, can you know, you start grinding at that, right? It's slowly going to come back. You don't lose skill overnight. A goalie coach taught me that once. Like, no matter how bad you play, like your True. skill's not gone. It's still there. Between the ears is so important, right? Like something that, is he working with someone? Can he find a way to get there? Again, we're still early into the season. You know, there's a yeah. lot of place. And we have another good goalie to protect him too, right? You need that dynamic, but when it goes south man is it tough it's tough it it snowballs on you and, and i feel for him because i've been there before but it's one of those things it's it's this position we chose it sucks sometimes when i work with kids and talk to them and you know they're like this is hard i'm like well then you shouldn't have been a goalie like i'm yeah. trying to be a dick but True. this is the, this is the life you chose man this is the way it is and it's it is what it is right look uh, i'll for, i'll subscribe to the frank Savali uh school of teaching uh Ilya, i go up to him Ilya, you're hurt uh, no, I'm not. Yeah, you're injured. Uh, you're going on injured reserve. Feel better in a couple of weeks, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. For now, just rehab the injury with Curtis Sanford, the goaltending coach. Like, dude, you don't think that's ever happened? I couldn't oh. agree more. With Jack Campbell front, like we saw this at dude. It, it's becoming. I covered Jack Campbell when he was a Leaf. Like, this is a spitting image of what happened to Jack Campbell and how his just emotion like deteriorated over time, and how his play deteriorated over time. Like, we're seeing it again. The rolling Sammy out to the media, like it's it's Groundhog Day for that too. So that's probably the best approach. Uh, I did bring it up earlier on. I think the silver lining. They have five games in seventeen days. They got the Global Series coming up, so that that allows them some practice time. So uh, even to end this week, I wanted to get your opinion. They got Wednesday against Ottawa. It's going to be Joe Wall tomorrow. Then you got the back to back Friday, Saturday Hall of Fame weekend, both on home ice. Very rare. Uh, you have Calgary Friday. You have Vancouver Saturday, then you go off to Sweden. They play next Friday, Minnesota, Detroit, Friday, Sunday. I think you start well both those games. So what's the perfect spot? You, I would say Samsonov on Friday against Calgary. You, you take your chances, right? Yeah, I think the weaker team, right? you got to get them in there. Something yeah. like maybe a feel-good game, something to get them going. Now you have some space where you can just get rolling and kind of find it. And Wool in the back-to-back, -back, he's been great, right? I don't think he's going to yeah. lose his rhythm by any means. Um and it's a big challenge here. This Canadian slate is not going to be easy, right? I know no. Calgary's been strong, but they still have a good team, right? They still desperate have desperate teams, man. Desperate teams, right? right they now can playing. find yeah. it, and it's it's going to be a it's going to be a good show here. And I like the trip, the Global Series. I've I've been to one before. It's very not good for like, yeah. yeah, not a big deal. We played Tampa, lost both, but it was <laughs> shout fun. To, shout out to Biz. <laughs> Actually, Tampa was Tampa was shit. They were shit going into it, and then they beat us both, and that's when they just went on a tear. But we, uh, <laughs> but lots of good bonding, right? Like you get out, you get to know your teammates. By bonding, more. they mean going to the club and getting bottle service is that bonding in europe or yes it could yes. be it depends yes. i was obviously not doing a part of that no but, uh, no we, no, uh, not right. yes. no but i just think that's a good like even just for the team to bond and, and find a way like decomp get out of toronto get out of the shit like just go and and enjoy yourself right it's a good trip and obviously you got to win some hockey games but it's it's going to be a lot of fun
It will, and uh, we're going to document that, obviously, over the next couple of weeks as they head over to Sweden. you got to feel for Timothy Lilligren, but you have to think Willie Nylander is going to be an absolute rock star in Sweden. Oh, and yeah. uh, it's so least, but both of those games will be technically road games. They're playing Minnesota. They're playing Detroit. I believe the Minnesota game's at 2 Eastern time. The Detroit one's on the Sunday. Could be vice versa, but like at 8 a.m. Eastern time on a Sunday. I hate football, so I'll be up for that game. But uh, yeah, like it, it's just fascinating with this team. You look at their record and you would think like the sky's falling considering the media coverage and like they're there. I mean, again, if you compare it to the numbers the last couple of years, um, you know, standings wise, it's the same old story for this Leafs team. But it just seems like there's so many fires to put out goaltending defensively, fourth line. Like, as I said earlier on, uh, I, I think. There's no pass for this team just because they came out and found a way to beat Tampa. Like, I think they're still up against it big time. And again, desperation is a big word for me. Wednesday, you're going to have two very desperate teams. At least I hope the Leafs are still desperate. The Ottawa Senators, they got fire DJ chance. They got their captain calling out the crowd, man. Like, they're they're going to be ready to go in that game. And like, the Sens always get up for the Leafs. So I'm, I won't lie. I'm, I'm, I'm borderline worried, concerned by the Maple Leafs just because of what we've seen early on in the season where I, I hate that I have no clue what team's going to show up here. I know, but like it's rightfully, nuts. rightfully so yeah. it's not like it's the first time they've done it to. It's like the boy who cried wolf at this point. Yeah. You don't yeah. know what you're going to get. It's like literally they could come out and just actually smash them. Right. And this is a game Probably. that just yeah. makes me nervous, but like yeah. the over seems like the play too on this one. Like I just, the way that things are going and the way, like not even like wool has been good, but I still think this is going to be, a wide open hockey game, especially the way very, these two teams, very the way these two teams play, right? Very their, their coaches, their coaches telling the crowd that they're not booing him, they're booing the players, right? Like, and that's your coach saying that, right? That's a tough one to the media, right? It's one thing behind closed doors, but like, come on, man, this is going to be an interesting one. I would love to build this game if I'm in the marketing department. Winner is happy for a day, loser, while well, the coach is getting fired. How's that feel? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't endorse Sheldon Keefe losing his job. Ultimately, to me, it comes down to the players. I mean, how many different players are you going to have on this roster and play the same way? But again, people like pointing fingers in every market in this league, specifically in Toronto. OK, let's blame the coach. And I guess Guy Bush, I don't know who the hell's the answer. I mean, it, it's just such a scapegoat. Um, coaching is one thing, but these are professional athletes. Get your head out of your ass and start playing some hockey and be consistent. And and that's the thing that drives me nuts, man, just to wrap is like, you see these spurts from the Maple Leafs and you know this team has it in them. Is that coaching or is that just players being like, you know what, I'm gonna take this shift off? Not not to say they are, but they're wildly inconsistent. Like I have not seen a team where one minute they look like gangbusters, they come back from 4-1 against one of the best teams in the last decade, and then one second they're losing to like the shittiest team in the league. It just makes no sense to me. I know. I I just feel like it falls back to like structure. You know, like you mm -hmm. have to have the right structure in place defensively yeah. everywhere. So then when you aren't feeling, especially when you're paying, uh, you're playing a high flying game, when you're off mm -hmm. a little bit, you're off, right? It's yeah. got to be bang on, but let's go back to the structure and depth, right? Like when is the third, fourth line winning you games? Third line was good, but fourth line sucks, right? You yeah. need, you need nights where it's like our superstars can't be like win every single game somebody's got to pick us up or at least get the mojo going in the building in the rink and like drag those guys into the fight and that hasn't happened i love uh the celebration when the the third line actually scored a goal like i don't know <laughs> i think there's going to be a parade of the fourth line scores a goal but nevertheless the botano wrap-up is presented by botano.ca the game starts now 19 plus please play responsibly give ourselves a pat in the back by the way for our betting looks yesterday we like the leafs uh we, we, we wanted to hit Nisey, Matthews, like everybody seemed to hit. And the Leafs got uh, took care of business, I guess, to an extent, 6-5. I, I I still hated how Tampa tied the game. Like Toronto, just just shut it down, Mariano Rivera style. But nevertheless, bunch of action tonight, 11 games. Uh, I, I like uh, the Colorado-New Jersey game. I'm expecting a response here from the Avs. They've been shut out three in the last four games. So I think it shows you that you're going to have blips throughout a season. You can speak to this. You've played in this league. There's going to be moments where you're not feeling it. You're not good. And it's how you react that sets you apart from other teams. No. Yeah. I think that's honestly, it yeah. happens, right? You're going to, but the good teams find a way to get through this. Right. And it's, it's the management of that. And especially the way, like we talk about other, any outside of San Jose, even probably right now, oh, any team can win on any given night, right? You get a good goalie performance. You, you should come out of retirement. Honestly, I don't know. I'm you thought just, about I, it. I, I I got this cushy job now. I kind of <laughs> like it, buddy. I don't know. This is a lot of stress. I don't know if my mental health could handle what's going on in Toronto right now, but 
Jeez. You think it's worse than San Jose or Toronto for goaltenders? Oh, it's worse than San Jose, but it's like it's worse like on the ice probably in San Jose what they give up. Like I know block what he's There's no media. Boy. Yeah, at least that. Like here, it's like if you're Samsonov, like imagine just going outside for a walk or like wherever you're going, like shit. and like not even people saying shit. Like when it's in your head, you just see people like looking at you. You know, and it's like you know I suck, and you looking at me like, man, I've been there before. It's not a fun place. You, you, I can, I can picture you just strolling around Chippewa and Buffalo, and people are like, "Who is this fucking mutant? Get him out of town immediately!" <laughs> yeah, seriously, that was not a lot of love. All, all every time I was there, I just hear about Dominic Hasek. I was like, "You fucking played oh. three years ago, man! Like, what do you, what do you want from me, man? You signed a thirty-one-year-old backup. Don't be mad at me, man. Were you there in the Tim Murray era? No, no, I was after. I had Jason Botterill. Think, oh, okay, I love that guy. Yeah, yeah. Well, Boss he bought this house guy. for me. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Fair. I remember the Tim, <laughs> the Tim Murray was uh, extra special in Buffalo, but it seems like that team's found it, its footing a bit. I know I got some heat from Sabres fans the other day because I called them a fraud on on social media, which is unsurprising to many. But uh, I do think <laughs> Buffalo is a fraud team. Uh, Huts, great job stepping in the last couple of days. We're gonna reconvene, I believe, in a couple of weeks and uh, let the roller coaster continue for this Maple Leafs team. Yeah, let's go. Keep. I'll be watching, buddy. Keep it rolling, and uh, just like that roller coaster, buckle up because you're back on the Superman. I, I'm. Yeah, that's how it feels. Uh, I tell my buddies from that time, Darian Lake. It's just a, a an uneasy feeling, man. I remember I used to wear glasses. So I was holding those glasses. They made me take them off, and it was just like they might come out. I I think I almost shit myself, and that's how I feel <laughs> watching the Leafs. That's my comp. I feel like shitting myself every time I watch Toronto Maple Leafs because I don't know what they're gonna bring to the table. Anyways, thank you to everybody in the chat. You guys are fantastic today. You've been bringing it all season long. Really, we've been pumping our tires. Great to see. We're now at 5.2 thousand subs. Appreciate it here on YouTube at the Leafs Nation 401. Uh, many thanks to producer Aaron Bordado bringing it as per usual. I know he's a Oilers fan. He's really up against it. He's in one big time right now, but you still showed up for work today. And, that, and that's a positive here for this show. Many thanks to Frank Saravalli. And again, Rosie back in the mix tomorrow. Can't wait to see how Palm Springs was. Can't wait to see how the uh, rest of the week goes here on the show. Again, uh, that's Carter Hutton. I'm Nick Alberga. We'll talk on Wednesday to preview the battle, the first battle of Ontario. Take care. Thank you for watching Leafs Morning Take. Hit that subscribe button and never miss a show. And for more, visit theleafsnation.com. T-H-E-L-E-A-F-S-N-A-T-I-O-N. Dot com. <laughs> if you don't know how to spell the Leafs Nation, you know what I mean? Um, but hey, sometimes you never know.